What is going on everybody? My name is JB. Welcome to the All Things Mechanical YouTube channel. Today I've got something that I'm really, really excited about. Um, and I know this is probably a silly thing for an almost 40 year old guy to be excited about, but I bought a Nerf gun. But not just any Nerf gun. I got an M41A pulse rifle Nerf gun. Yep, that's right. This has been in FedEx purgatory for about a week and it finally arrived. I don't know why it got stuck in Texas for four days, but here it is. We have the Nerf Hasbro Limited Edition M41A Pulse Rifle. Now, there are a bunch of videos on this thing already out there in the ether on YouTube, but nevertheless, I'm going to unbox this thing for you guys. Spoiler alert, I've already taken it out of the package, so all the tape has been cut, but we're going to have a look at it real quick. We're going to look at the packaging. I'm going to give you my two cents on it, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to be doing with this thing. And hint, it's not going to be used as a Nerf gun. Uh, just because I want to make it into an almost exact replica of one of the movie hero props. Uh, and I'm going to make it into a wall hanger. This thing is not going to be used for anything. It's going to be a display piece. So my goal here is to make it as, as realistic looking as possible. And to do that, I'm going to have to go through a pretty extensive uh, modification process with this thing. But before we get into any of that, let's just go ahead and get this thing out of the package. Just open this box up and have a quick look at this thing. Um, if you're like me at all, and you grew up watching the Aliens franchise, I think the second one, Aliens, is probably the best one out of the four or five movies that they've made now, not counting the Prometheus films and all that stuff. Um, Alien 3 was okay, the original Alien's always going to be a classic, but I just think that Aliens just hit every single mark that could possibly be hit. A great cast, um, iconic weapons, and just it really, really launched me into the whole realm of the Aliens franchise. And that movie remains my go-to as far as what I believe is the best one out of all of them. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and slip this uh, Nerf Limited cover off. Um, what they've done with the packaging is actually really cool. Um, with the exception of one thing that I don't care for, but I'll get into that in a second. But these are actual holes. These look like acid burns from, you know, alien blood. And this is all pressed into the cardboard. It's actually embossed. So you can, like, feel the texture difference and the depth difference of all these imprints. So that's kind of a neat touch. And they made it look like basically a rifle case. Now, here we're going to start getting into the things that I don't really understand. They've got LV-426 on here. Which, if you're not familiar with the Aliens movies, LV-426 is the planet that the Aliens landed on and took over and killed all of the colonists at Hadley's Hope, which is an outpost on that planet. So we're getting, I don't really see the point of having LV-426 on a pulse rifle box. I don't get that. That has nothing to do with the weapon. <laughs> it's just movie stuff. On the sides, more imprinting, M41A on both sides. On the back, Armat um, is the fictional company, Armat Battlefield Systems is the fictional company that actually produced the M41A pulse rifle, as well as several other weapons in the whole Alien franchise. Um, if we want to really get into the whole fan fiction part of this, which I'm not going to delve into too deeply because, to be completely honest, I am not an expert on any of that. But Armat is the fictional company that originally designed and produced the M41A for the United States Colonial Marine Corps, which is the division of the military that was issued this weapon in the Aliens world. More of the stuff that I don't understand. You can see under the barcode here, or above the barcode rather, Wayland yutani Corporation. Wayland yutani is the company that owned the Nostromo, which was the star freighter that was from the first Alien movie that Sigourney Weaver was one of the flight officers on. And they, Wayland yutani you know, in the Aliens franchise, they are this huge multinational, multi-world organization. But they essentially bankrolled a lot of the operations, and their whole thing was that they wanted to get their hands on one of these aliens so they could do biological studies on it and weaponize it for their own gain. This is just more, well, hey, we're just going to slap a bunch of crap from the movies on there that people might recognize. Doing that, I think, takes away from the overall appeal of the packaging. Whalen yutani had nothing to do with the pulse rifle. <clears throat> but that's, again, just my opinion. So what we're going to do now, let's go ahead and open this thing up. It just lifts out from the front, and you open it up. And they did a very nice job on the inside of this with... Some notable exceptions, once again, that I'll get into as we kind of move through this. 
and see how much of that you can see. You can't see the back lid, so we'll just start here with the actual pulse rifle itself. Um, this is it right here. Comes with the the U.S. Uh, Colonial Marine Corps emblem on this little center cover that just lifts out, which is imprinted on both sides, which is a you know neat effect. And here we have the rifle itself. This is a 10 round primary magazine and a single load from the front grenade launcher. So the pump is functional, the main trigger is functional, and the secondary trigger is obviously for the grenade launcher. Comes with 10 normal sized darts that load into the magazine and then three of the grenade rounds that just get loaded one at a time in the front. Then you just pump it and fire it. Uh, ejection port does open, so you can clear um, Nerf bullet jams if necessary. But again, that's probably never going to be an issue for me because I will probably never ever use this thing as an actual Nerf gun. And we'll get to the hideous paint job here in a second. But the reason that I bought this is that the ammo counter on the side actually works. This is almost identical to the movie version. I mean, it's just a simple LCD screen, but this is pre-programmed to, to go to 10 rounds. When you put a magazine in, it will pop up 10 on there. And then as you pull the trigger and fire the darts, the counter actually works. It will count down to zero as you fire the darts. The cool thing about it though is using these up and down arrows, you can actually cycle this thing all the way up to 95. Actually it goes up to 99, but in the movie the maximum capacity on one of these magazines for 10 millimeter explosive tipped caseless ammo, which is what the pulse rifle fires, some imaginary round, um, this little magazine somehow contained 95 rounds of that. Which didn't even register in my head at the time, because as a kid I knew nothing about firearms, but as someone now who owns real guns and knows quite a bit about them, that seems a little bit silly. But we can set this thing to go all the way to 95 and when you take the magazine out you get two hash marks on there going across because there's no ammo in the gun and then when you put the magazine back in it pops back up to 95 and it will count down as you fire the darts it'll count down from 95 to zero um it won't just you know stop it won't go from like 95 to 85 and then stop because you're out of ammo it will as long as you pull the trigger um it will continue counting down so they really knocked it out of the park with the, with the ammo counter. And that's really the primary reason that I bought this thing. A, because it's almost a one-to-one -one scale. It's very, very close dimensionally to the real thing. Certainly, you know, hanging on a wall, it will look like the real thing when I'm done with it. But the fact that the ammo counter is real and works, and you can set it to look just like the movie, that's a huge win. Now let's address the elephant in the room. This absolutely hideous power loader paint job they put on this thing. Hasbro. What are you doing, man? What the hell? <laughs> Why are you painting this thing to look like a power loader? Get away from her, you bitch! It's not a loader, it's a pulse rifle. These things are brown and black. That's what they're supposed to be. You look at the actual hero props, they were painted a color called Brown Best, which with the lighting on set in the Aliens movie does make it look sort of OD green, but these were actually painted brown. Brown here and then black for everything else. This was a, you know, the cage of a Spaz 12, uh, 12 gauge shotgun tacked on to an M1A1 Thompson, if you didn't know. This was actually made from real guns that they kind of made an amalgamation of and linked together with these side panels. So I just don't understand that the paint job that they did here. Now I get it, it's a Nerf gun. Nerf guns are made for children. But let's stop and think about this for a second. The target demographic here is clearly not children, okay? They're modeling this after a real weapon from an R-rated horror movie. They know exactly who's gonna be buying this. You know, Timmy the 12-year-old down the street isn't gonna plunk down a hundred bucks for one of these things when you can get so many other, you know, Nerf guns or X-Shot or whatever it is now that function better than this and have more ammo capacity and have better features, blah, blah, blah. This, to me, is a replica designed for big kids. Adults, just paint it the right colors. You don't need to go with the safety orange and yellow and all the. Well, I mean, the safety orange, I think, is required, at least on the on the ends, per federal law. But there was no reason to do that with the triggers. There was no reason to paint it white and yellow and black. Just make it brown and black and put a freaking or orange or red tip on the end and people can do what they want with it. That's my opinion, anyway. I think it was kind of a, a missed approach to go completely different on the color scheme for this thing. Even though it's a Nerf gun, Nerf isn't in the business of building real looking weapons. Maybe they made this so they could send it out on a global scale. I don't know if countries over in Europe or elsewhere in the world are even allowed to have toy guns painted real colors. I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know what your laws are if you live outside of the US. I'm just speaking from my personal perspective 
on how I think this thing should look. But anyway, before we get this thing out, I just want to pivot the camera up a little bit and show you the, the lid of the box, which I think is really cool. They did a decent job on this. They have sort of a, a cutaway, not a cutaway, but like a, a diagram version of what the Armat M41A is supposed to look like. And they actually have little little indicators here that like are, I guess, supposed to explain what everything does on this. And then over here, you can see this, is, this isn't this is torn. This is actually, they painted it to look like, like the stuff was torn off. Over here, there's a number list here, which I presume if that hadn't been torn off would correspond to all parts of the weapon that they're trying to explain and list out. So you've got your USS Sulaco, which is the, the main ship that the Colonial Marines used. You have the Colonial Marines logo. You have the Nerf logo, obviously, over here. Armat M41A. And then again with the Weyland yutani stuff, which has no bearing on the pulse rifle because they didn't have anything to do with it. But whatever. I've already covered that point. But all in all, the packaging is really cool. And I was actually debating whether or not I wanted to cut this apart and kind of use this as a background for where I'm going to have this thing mounted on the wall, but after looking at it more closely, I think I would rather actually download and print out something and maybe go that route. That way it doesn't have the Nerf logos and all this other Wayland yutani crap all over it. Um, but that's going to be for another video, I'm sure. So anyway, enough of me talking about this thing. Let's get it out and let's have an actual look at it. So let me turn the camera around to give you a better view and we'll go from there. All right, so here we have it in hand, guys, and like I was saying earlier, from a distance, this thing is very convincing. It is almost exactly the correct dimensions. Obviously, it's it's quite a bit wider, I think, than it normally would be, just simply due to the fact that there's a bunch of motors and drive mechanisms and everything in here to actually launch the Nerf darts out, but this thing actually, it, it fits the bill pretty well. So with a new paint job, which I will explain shortly, um this thing will look pretty convincing. I've seen some really, really solid work from other uh, makers on YouTube that do a really good job with this kind of thing. So I'm excited to put my spin on it. I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than everybody else, probably to my detriment. <laughs> I'm probably gonna make a lot more work for myself, but um, that's just how I roll. I, I wanna do it my way, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, magazine release is right here on the side. So you get your 10 round Nerf mag, which looks nothing like the, the obviously in real life, this would be fed by a Thompson magazine with a custom base plate on it, and the Thompson M1A1 machine gun was a, a double stack 45 ACP round, which is obviously quite a bit smaller than these Nerf darts. So, dimensionally, the magazine does not work. The base plate on the magazine does not match the lines of the gun, which bugs me a little bit, but I've seen some people 3D print new ones. Um, I don't have a 3D printer yet. That is something I'm working on getting. So maybe eventually I'll be able to 3D print something and paint it to match. But that's really not the biggest problem that this thing has. It's this coloring. But we'll solve that. But I wish I had batteries in it. But again, I just got this thing a couple hours ago. I haven't even really taken it out of the box before now other than just looking at it. So I haven't had a chance to put batteries in it. Um, it uses... 4C batteries, which I don't understand why Nerf still does that. Who in the heck still uses C batteries? Just get a rechargeable lithium-ion pack for it or something. Which I might actually end up doing. I might custom custom rig something up. I know my sons have a bunch of airsoft guns with lithium-ion or lithium polymer batteries laying around, so I might be able to do something with that. But Anyway, if you were to put the magazine in, you'd get your counter showing a full magazine and then get your pump action up front here, which is functional. It doesn't sound anything like a real gun, it sounds like a toy, but that's fine. Again, this is going to be a wall hanger. Really, really weak. Really weak spring in there. But you just load your darts one at a time in the front there, so you can't load them in like shotgun shells and, and you know, rack and go like you could with the real thing. But all in all, I'm pretty happy with this thing. The stock does not retract, which bugs me. We have this other thing down here, which is a combination safety as well as a motor activation switch. So when you pull this, you have two motors inside here attached to wheels that spin up and start spinning really, really fast. And you have a pusher motor back here. So when you pull the trigger, that activates your pusher motor, which pushes the dart out of the magazine and into those wheels, which slightly compresses the dart. And then obviously because those wheels are going so fast, it just causes the dart to go and fly out the barrel. Um, obviously, being a Nerf gun and not being a Thompson machine gun, on the real thing, the barrel's up here on the Thompson. 
Um, because of the size and complexity of the Nerf system, this is not the actual barrel. They have this other barrel, which normally on the real thing would not be here. This is the actual barrel where the darts come out. So that this end is going to get chopped off. So that's flush, just to make it look a little bit more like the real thing. But we'll get into the rest of the modifications here shortly. So that's basically it in a nutshell. It's a, a very simple thing, but they did a great job cosmetically with how this thing looks. It's very close. More than adequate to, to make it a good prop or a good cosplay weapon, if that is your thing. I'm not a cosplayer. I've never gone to a Comic-Con or any kind of convention in my life. But um, as far as making this thing look a lot better, that's what we're going to do. And I will go ahead and flip the camera back around and get this thing set back over on the bench. And I will go through with you what modifications I'm going to make and how we're going to get there. So give me a second. All right. Let's go ahead and get this thing back on the bench, desk, whatever you want to call it. And let's talk shop here on how we're going to get this thing looking like an actual pulse rifle and not like this hideously ugly yellow toy. So, here's what I want to do with this thing. First and foremost, any exposed logos, we're going to get sanded off. Nerf logo, that's going to go. Anything that's printed on here, probably going to get sanded down. All this safety text that they have kind of molded in back here. I'm not sure how well that's going to show up on the camera, but there's all these little recessed areas with the text molded in. Those are going to get puttied over, uh, probably with body filler or something. We're going to smooth all that out. May or may not actually, this is the battery compartment here, like I mentioned earlier. I may or may not actually seal this up so that that big old rectangle is not there. Might fill in that screw hole too. Still debating on that. You can still access the battery compartment if you uh, take off these side plates without getting into the guts of the gun. These these two side panels are actually a separate piece, and I'll, I'll show you all that later when we actually start taking this thing apart. But you can still, by unscrewing all these screws, you can still change out the batteries. But what I'm thinking I might do is whip up a custom uh, lithium-ion battery pack wire that in and then just have a little charging dongle or something sticking out back here where I can recharge it if I need to. Because really, like I said, I'm not going to be using this as an actual Nerf gun. I'm going to be using it as a display piece with a functional ammo counter. That's about it. So I'll probably never actually use this thing as a Nerf gun. Um, maybe. I don't know. Let's flip this thing over real quick. Show you the other side. Same thing here. We got that Nerf logo that's going to have to go. Um, there are a few differences on here that deviate from the real thing. Obviously this trigger is much bigger than it would be on a real gun. This magazine well is much bigger than it would be on the real thing simply because of, you know, the physics of the Nerf darts. Um, nothing we can really do about that. I saw another maker over in the UK, I think it was his channel's Prop It Up. I think I might have gotten that wrong. Um, he actually sanded this uh, triangle pointer thing down. And then he actually sanded this thing off. This is only here to make some space for one of the uh, launching motors inside there, the flywheel motors that propel the darts. I'm probably going to end up doing the same thing he did, sanding both this and this flush and then plating over that with some ABS plastic maybe. He went the extra mile and he actually took a piece of another plastic toy with a similar curve with a corner on it and actually molded a corner onto this, which looked fantastic. He did a wonderful job with that, but that might be a little bit more than what I want to do with this for me personally. Other thing that's going to have to go, why? Why did you put the Aliens logo right over the ejection port for the grenade launcher? Why? I don't get that. Also on the bottom here, there is no loading port or even a mock loading port for where you would actually load the grenades in if this were a real gun. So I might, depending on how the internals of this thing are set up, I might add an ejection port on the bottom with some uh, aluminum sheet. I am going to sand the Aliens logo off of this and cut out a piece of aluminum sheet and put a slight radius on it so it fits in there and attach that, glue that in place so the actual ejection port doesn't have any writing on it and it's metal. And then I might do the same thing if there's room with a piece of aluminum inside here um, to make it look like there's a loading port for the real grenade rounds underneath there. 
Uh, here we have all of th these are supposed to be vented. This is uh, actually a heat shield for the Spa's 12 shotgun cage. These are supposed to be hollow, obviously. That allows airflow to pass through on the real thing for cooling. So I think what I'm going to do is take my Dremel, um, just like Prop It Up did. If I'm, I hope I got his channel name right. If I'm butchering that, I apologize. I'll I'll annotate it on the on the screen if I've screwed that up. But he actually took his Dremel and he cut out all of these. And I'm probably going to do the same thing just to add that that next little bit of realism. Let's see what else. I already mentioned that we're going to be cutting this barrel end off to kind of hide that a little bit. Obviously, the orange inner barrel there is going to go. I'm not sure if I'm just going to paint that or just take it out completely because, like I said, I will probably never, ever, ever use this as a Nerf gun. Um, I'm not going to dis you know disable it completely just because I want all the weight I can get in this thing to make it feel a little bit more realistic. And I'm going to be actually adding weight to this as well in my own way. Um, again, this will be another part of the video that we'll go into more detail on that. Let's see. Talked about the loading port, the ejection port, the heat shields, sanding off the logos. Um, oh yeah, well, I'm going to probably add some kind of bolt handle on here because the Thompson bolt handle actually stuck out about, you know, about three quarters of an inch, I believe, maybe a little longer than that. Um, might go the extra, extra mile and actually get some socket head cap screws that match these sizes and actually insert those in here and, and drill out the plastic ones just to have some more metal on this thing. Might do that, might not. I'm going to have to kind of see what kind of complexity we're dealing with inside here. This right here is actually the speaker for the soundboard, which, guys, that's so dumb. Sorry guys, the wife called and I don't remember where I was at. I think I was talking about the soundboard. So this hole right here is actually, there's a little speaker inside here for the soundboard. So basically, when you change your ammo counter, it'll chime at you. Um, whenever you pull the main trigger, you get a little like three round burst pulse rifle noise. Whenever you pull the grenade launcher, you get an explosion noise or a, you know, a grenade round firing noise. You can't replicate movie sounds in a toy like this. It's stupid. I don't know why they even put a soundboard in there. That and plus the sound effects they use don't actually even sound like the real pulse rifle firing. It just sounds like a three-round burst machine gun. It doesn't actually the pulse rifle, if you've ever seen aliens, you know it has a very, very unique sound. It's not a real sound, obviously. Real guns don't sound like that, but they did a very good job of making this thing stand on its own as its own platform, its own weapon system. That's a very unique character to it. And you can't replicate that with a quarter-sized little tiny speaker and a soundboard. I just, I think they would have been better off just doing away with that completely. It makes no sense to me because it doesn't sound anything like the real thing. And you can't get it to sound like the real thing. The only exception, you know, as far as toys go, where I think a soundboard is kind of cool, are with lightsabers. They actually have fairly decent speakers on those things. They're not perfect, but... You can program a lot of really interesting features and, and sounds into those things and actually have it sound somewhat like the real thing. Simply because we know a lightsaber isn't nearly as loud as a rifle firing. You can get away with having those different sound effects on a, something that small. Uh, but for, for this, uh, I might just cut the wires to that speaker and put a socket head cap screw there, honestly. I just think that's kind of stupid. So again, just my opinion, guys. I don't, I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. You know, we're all we're all adults here. We're allowed to have our opinions about this thing. They've missed the mark on a few items, and I'm pointing those out. I'm giving you guys my real opinion on the whole thing. So again, I, I wish I had batteries in this thing so I could actually demonstrate those sounds to you. But all right, guys, little footage splice time. You think I was gonna allow this video to go on without at least showing you what the thing sounds like? Well, originally I wasn't. I actually had intended to put batteries in it in another video, but after doing the post-production on this, I can't leave it like that. You guys have to at least be able to see what this thing sounds like as it currently is. So, here we go. You got batteries in this thing. Interestingly enough, I had to go through two different sets of C batteries to get this thing to fire up. I put a brand new set of El Cheapo batteries from Walgreens in this thing, and I could only get the grenade launcher sound to sometimes work. Um, the counter turned on, obviously, on the side. That's... That's obviously on right now. It's at double zeros because I ran it out of ammo. Um, but when you tried to spin up the motors with that first set of batteries, it wouldn't even spin up. It would just cause the display to go blank. So these little motors in here draw quite a bit of current. So you want to get some decent Duracells or Energizers or whatever 
probably lithium-based cells if you can, if you're intending to use this thing as a Nerf gun. I have a set of Rayovax in there now because it's the only other C batteries I had in our little battery box. Um, and they barely, they barely worked. So as you can see, the screen does time out after a few minutes of sitting here without any action taking place. So it won't run continuously. Let's see if I can turn this back on real quick. There you go. All right. Interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but it will make a clicking noise out of the speaker when you're at zero. My problem is I can't get it to do that without these stupid motors turning on as well. I'm going to see if I can kind of bypass the motors by just barely squeezing this enough to get this trigger to move. Because again, this is a partial safety and it also spins the motors up. You cannot pull the main trigger without having this depressed as well. So I'm going to see if I can fudge that and pull it back just enough to get the main trigger to go without turning the motors on. There. Eh, kind of. But you can hear it just go and that's your out of ammo sound. So when you pull this out, your magazine out, nothing in the gun, you get those two uh, dash, dashes going across the display, and then you put it back in, and it goes back to 10, and then you get your actual pulse rifle noise. And then, I, I managed to do it that time without having the main motors kick on until the very end there, so... It actually does sound a little bit like a pulse rifle, but not, not entirely. I mean, I guess they had to make some compromises somewhere, given the fact they have this teeny tiny little speaker back here. But the grenade launcher, you can get that to make noise without even, uh, it's just a sensor inside this trigger, so. So there's your grenade noise. Doesn't matter whether there's a shell in there or not. So, and then you can adjust this to have it go all the way up. I'm going to set it for 95 because that's the, the movie version. It will go, like I said, it will go all the way up to 99. And then it maxes out. But 95 was the capacity in the movie version. So that is what I'm going to set it for. There we go. Pretty sweet. That's the whole reason I bought this thing is that, that counter. Um, the rest of it, meh. I'm just going to make it look as real as I can. Back to the main part of the video. That's what it sounds like. I'm trying to remember, I think the only other thing I really want to change is this trigger. Obviously, on a real Thompson, M1A1 Thompson, or most rifles, it's not a blade style trigger like this. It doesn't slide directly to the rear, it doesn't go backward like that. It pivots, so you don't have this extra plastic behind it. You just have the blade portion of the trigger right here. So I'm going to cut away all of this to make it look, to have it open back here to make it look more like the real thing. And I think that's pretty much it. Honestly, guys, they did a really, really good job. Other than the stupid Weyland Yutani yogo, yogos? Logos on this thing, which should not be there. Um, they did a great job on it, you know, aesthetically as far as the actual shape of it. Um, even even the, the foregrip up here for the, for the shotgun, they actually put the cutaway in there when you pump it back. On a real shotgun, you, you have to have that there so you, you clear the ejection port and you're not, you know, stopping your rounds from ejecting as you're cycling the, the action. They got the shape pretty much correct. It's not a perfect replica, but they got the shape front and rear, you know, it kind of pivots down like that. It's kind of like a quasi hand stop. They did a good job. I mean, really, they, they paid attention to a lot of the small details. The problem is they had to pack it full of a whole bunch of other nonsense that kind of takes away from it, you know, the overall appearance of it. But that's okay. We're going to remedy all that. And now I'm going to show you what I'm going to use to do that. First of all, the whole thing is going to be stripped down. All of it. Most people paint these things black and green or black and brown of some flavor or whatever, and then they take a silver paint marker and they make it look weathered and everything. I'm going to go one step beyond that. And it's probably completely unnecessary, and I'm probably making a ton more work for myself, and it may or may not turn out any better or worse than anything anyone else has already done. But we are going to paint this thing a lot, obviously. I'm sure that doesn't even need to be said. But typically I use Rust-Oleum, but I've been having some issues with Rust-Oleum lately, and I think that Krylon Fusion is the better paint for plastic. So I have Satin Black... I have flat black, I have matte clear, which I may or may not use, I'm not sure if it's going to need a clear coat yet, 
Got some plastic primer. May or may not need that either because the Fusion has, you know, primer mixed in with it. But I got it just in case. And then I have metallic aluminum spray. So, guys, if you're new to the channel, my background is uh, pretty varied. I've had several different careers in my lifetime, but I spent about 10 years of my life working in public safety, including several years as an EMT, several years as a cop. And while I was a cop, I was also a law enforcement firearms instructor. I know a lot about firearms. I know a lot about how they work. I know a lot about how they wear. I know a lot about how they get damaged. And I see a lot of people who know nothing about firearms weathering guns and putting them on YouTube. And I am not taking anything away from anybody because a lot of these makers on YouTube are out there doing this cosplay stuff. They do an absolutely phenomenal job. They do things that I could never, ever do on my best day. So I am not taking anything away from any of those people. So please don't be offended by what I'm about to say. I'm just saying it's obvious that those people don't know anything about firearms, okay? They're taking knives and they're cutting chunks out of their guns and they're, you know, knocking corners off and taking pieces out and doing that. When you are carrying a firearm for a living, that firearm is the key to whether or not you live or die, okay? You do not let it get damaged like that. And I guarantee you a Marine would not let his or her weapon get damaged like that. Wear is one thing, but cutting chunks out of the side of your gun or having gigantic pieces missing, that weapon is no longer safe to use. That doesn't happen in real life. <laughs> so here I'm going to be walking a very fine line between what is correct from a sci-fi perspective and what is correct based on knowing what I know about real guns and how they function. And I'm going to have to meet everybody somewhere in the middle on this. So please don't crucify me for what I'm saying. It's just the way I want to do my rifle. They're out there. They're available. You want to do it your way, go buy one. That's totally fine. I'm just saying this is how I'm going to do mine. And it ain't going to be weathering by taking a knife and going <laughs> and cutting chunks out of my weapon. Ain't happening. Not how it really works. Okay. Now. Rifles will get certain wear patterns on them based on whether you're left or right-handed. You're going to get wear, like for me, I'm right-handed. So the left side of the weapon will probably see a lot more wear because if I'm carrying it at a ready position, it's rubbing on my gear, it's rubbing on my vest, it's rubbing on my uniform, whatever I'm wearing. And that's putting a lot more wear on the back side of the gun that's tucked up against my body or my equipment. So there's going to be more wear on that side of the weapon than it would be on this side. Um... There's also wear from it being stowed or locked into a, a transporting device of some kind. Like my patrol rifles in my in my uh, Ford Expedition that I had. My ARs developed a little ring around them where the little clamp would lock onto them. And then you hit a button and it's a little magnetic lock that opens and you can take the rifle out. You know, so you have things like that. And granted, I don't know how it was. Uh, you know, the aliens world is not real, guys. So I don't know how it really would be working for the Colonial Marine Corps. I just know real guns and I'm going to weather this as closely as I can based on how I think a real wear pattern would actually be achieved. So here's what we're going to do with this. After I do all the cosmetic modifications, you know, cutting out all these slots, modifying the trigger, sanding everything down, prepping it all, figuring out all that stuff, sanding all the seam lines smooth and all that, you know, what have you. Um, after all the cosmetic modifications are done, we're going to prime this thing with a, a coat of, of primer. And then I'm going to put two or three coats of this Krylon Fusion Metallic Aluminum Spray as a base coat. Because guess what? Real firearms are made out of either aluminum or steel. Okay? That's what they're made out of. And I think that the silver spray paint, the aluminum spray paint, will probably be a, a perfect surrogate for both. I'm not looking about, you know, color variances based on whether the steel cage for the Spas 12 is going to be different than the aluminum shell of this or the aluminum heat shield up here. No doesn't really matter, but I am going to lay down an entire coat, several coats of that metallic aluminum base coat for the metal underneath all of the coatings because all of these coatings, whether it's the receiver or the heat shield or the cage, you start with raw metal and then it's either parkerized or anodized or some kind of protective coating is applied to the metal to protect it and keep it from either oxidizing or, you know, rusting. Oxidation, in the case of aluminum, it just turns dark. And then steel will obviously rust. 
So we're going to use this, this silver color as the base coat for underneath the exterior coatings that go on this thing. And then we're going to paint the shrouds in the appropriate brown bess color. This is from SMS, that's Scale Modeler Supply. This is Blaster Brown, part number, I believe it's yeah, PL219. This is their replica, or replica color, of the old brown bess color that they used on the original firearms, which was produced by a company over in the UK that is no longer in business, or that color has been discontinued. I don't know the exact situation. But But this is the actual color. Now, I did buy this Krylon Satin Otter Brown because at, at a glance in the store, it looked like a pretty close match, but it's clearly way too gray and not brown enough. And I actually did do a little test sheet here on some aluminum. Um, as you can see, I'm not sure. My phone is dying, so my flash isn't working, so I'm not sure how well this is going to show up on there. But this is the spray paint, obviously, and this is that brown best color or the blaster brown just applied with a q-tip and you can see that there is a pretty notable difference between the two this is much more brown this is much darker and more gray now i did take the q-tip and i applied some of this paint on this while it was wet and then after it was completely dried i applied more and i did that to see if there was going to be any interactions or checking or cracking or anything putting a different paint over this Krylon. Happily, there was no interactions at all because this is pre-thinned right out of the bottle. I mean, you just put this in, a, in an airbrush and spray. So that's what I'm going to do. I just wanted to make sure before I used this, I wasn't going to have any issues with there being any interactions between this and the other paint. Ironically, this aluminum sheet is actually what I'm going to be using to make the uh, ejection port cover here and then the loading port at the bottom if I end up doing that. So once we have all the different colors on here, we're going to have this painted in that blaster brown or brown best color. Everything else is going to be some variation of black. Obviously, all the orange stuff is going to have to go. This is all going to have to be taken out and, and painted. Once we do that, then I will weather this thing by hand using a piece of Scotch-Brite and a couple other things. And I will hit the corners, and I will hit the sides a little bit, and I will hit the areas around the pump. I'm going to put the pump back on as tight as I can get it, and I'm going to rack the... Th that looked good. Hmm? <laughs> There's a joke there somewhere, I'm sure you've already found it. I'm going to rack this pump back and forth and create the actual normal wear patterns of how a shotgun would look. That, that's exactly what happens on a normal shotgun. Your pump handle is going to actually wear into the blue wing or the parkerizing or whatever coating you have on the magazine tube or the shroud or whatever's here. That's how that works. And I'll weather a couple other little areas and stuff, but None of the weathering I'm going to be doing is going to be involving a knife or cutting chunks out or making it look like it's battle damaged. I mean, if it's battle damaged, it's no longer functional. You're going to be issued a new weapon. That's just how it is. Also, this is a magazine. It's not a clip. Okay? It's not a clip. I can make a whole other video and I can talk for hours about the differences there but as a former firearms instructor not using the right nomenclature drives me crazy and the fact that like call of duty and some other games still refer to these as clips ugh, ugh, drives me nuts clips load magazines magazines feed ammo into a weapon that's how that works the term clip comes around from the days of the m1 garand where you actually had to load the internal magazine built into the you know frame of the gun with a stripper clip you load it in from the top and then the clip pops out that's it so a clip loads a magazine. Same thing with loading an AR mag with a stripper clip. You can put those clips down on the back of the magazine and then throw the metal clip away. Clips load magazines. Magazines feed ammo into the gun. I know it's a colloquial thing at this point, and I'm probably going to get crucified in the comments for talking smack about that. Sorry that I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Um, there's really no two ways about it. If you can use nomenclature about firearms, use it the right way. Um, anyway, sorry. So, we're going to weather this thing like a real gun would get weathered. With a silver metallic base coat and the coating partially coming off. That's how that's going to work. So I'm going to wrap this introductory video up right here. And once I kind of get a better game plan and have a better space to work and do some painting, 
then we'll start breaking this down and we'll start making some modifications to it. So look for part two on this series coming out here pretty soon. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Hope you all have a great weekend. Be safe. Have fun. See you on the next one. We got a lot of work to do. So stick around. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you want to see the rest of this. Thanks again, guys. See you.